Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. Now this episode is a bit different than previous ones for a few reasons. I was fortunate to be able to attend a conference focused on the latest advancements in photobiology and equipment for commercial cultivation. We are talking about some of the largest commercial cultivators of cannabis in all of North America, as well as some of the big ornamental and vegetable producers. I was honored to be there, made some great contacts and learned a ton. Even met a few people who were familiar with the podcast, which was awesome. Jaya Palmer was also able to attend, and in this episode, we discuss some of what we learned as well as how these topics relate to the future of commercial cannabis production. If you listen to the most recent podcast, then you're already familiar with Jaya. He is a biological horticulture consultant with a long history in both cannabis and vegetable production and a proponent of regenerative agriculture. He's also a good friend and colleague. The following is just our unedited conversation discussing our notes and takeaways from what we learned this past weekend. Sometimes I get caught in a rabbit hole here in Washington State and on our farm and I'm not able to stay up to date with all the exciting new advancements and products and changes in the cannabis industry. This was a great chance to get perspective on where the industry appears to be headed and how that will affect growers in the coming years. So let's talk a little bit about this conference we attended. What, uh, what did you think of it? Any initial thoughts before we dive into some of the speakers? Oh, it's just great to be in a room full of people who are all leading the field in uh, controlled environment agriculture. We had uh, you know, university professors, financiers, master growers, some equipment manufacturers from a, from a HVAC and lighting and high density storage, pretty much all the people you'd need to design a cutting edge facility were there. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. It gave me some ideas on sort of where I think the future of cannabis cultivation and production is now that I've, I've got a little uh, more insight as to what some of these large scale commercial facilities and large scale uh, horticultural facilities are doing. But before we get into those thoughts, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the specific uh, speakers that we got to hear from. Uh, one of them being on the economic impact of light intensity on yield and secondary metabolites. And that was uh, Allison Justice with Outco. And Allison is someone that I've talked about in my talks. I know you'd sent me an article on her as well. Uh, their facility, when she came in, she was uh, she had a PhD in horticulture, I believe, and she came in and they were using Heavy 16 at this facility in California. And she was able to uh, formulate over the next seven or eight months uh, her own mineral salt regimen that dropped their cost uh, 27 times by what they were spending before on bottled nutrients. And I don't believe there was a single cannabis facility in the room that was using bottled nutrients because it just didn't make practical sense at the scale that they were at. I mean, we're talking about huge, huge facilities. And so that's a little bit about Allison. Now, the actual study that she was doing was looking on uh, how much light intensity cannabis can take. So we know that cannabis is a high, in, high light plant. It takes a, a pretty high level of intensity but we didn't know ex the exact effects of that in terms of its impact on plant physiology and yield and uh, overall quality. So I'm looking at my notes here and it looks like they took uh, 90 cannabis sativa variety was, uh, was hazy OG, an average temperature of 23.7 degrees Celsius with a, a variance of 1.7 degrees Celsius, an average, average relative humidity of uh, 52.5% and CO2 around 1500 ppm. And they ran uh, fluence LEDs at 400 ppfd, 600 ppfd, double ended HPS at 700 ppfd, and then uh, more fluence LEDs at 800 and 1200 uh, ppfd. It showed a daily light integral, which is the amount of light that plant gets over the course of the day, ranging from 7.3 micromoles up to 51.8. Uh, it looks like going back and looking at the data, they collected fresh weight, dry weight, and trim weight, and they saw a 26% increase in shoot fresh weight from going from 400 to 
600 as the average PPFD. And then from there on up, you get a slight increase, like from 800 to 1200 PPFD, you only saw an increase of about 5%. On the dry weight, that corresponded to about 6% between the two. So not significant, statistically significant, uh, according to the data. On the flower and trim weight, they saw the same thing, an increase as you increase the light intensity, you know, from 400 to 1200. And from 400 PPFD to 600 PPFD, you had a 51% increase in uh, trimmed flower weight. Let's see what else here. The uh, oh, the interesting thing: the total THC and active total active cannabinoids stayed exactly the same, with the exception of that 700 average PPFD, which was that double-ended HPS light, had lower uh, total THC and active cannabinoids. But then the total terpene concentrations were the same across the board regardless of the light intensity, including that uh, double-ended HPS. Mm-hmm, that's, it's interesting that terpene concentration will stay the same regardless of light technology or light intensity. But if we go from HPS to LED, then we see an increase in cannabinoid percentage from 19% cannabinoids with HPS to around 21 or 21.5 with um, LED light. Yeah, and then I know the next slide that she showed was one of your favorites from the whole conference, uh, looking at the grams per watt and grams per square foot, which gave us the amount of money generated per light, and then the amount of money generated minus your power consumption. This is where the LEDs really shined. It looks like at 1,200 PPFD, you were at uh, 1.2 grams per watt, but 72 grams per square foot. Mm-hmm. Now, the most efficient light was the 400 PPFD LED light at 1.7 grams per watt, but then we're only getting 34.2 grams per square foot. And square foot is just such an important aspect when we're talking about commercial production. So getting in that extra cost, even though your grams per watt drops, um, seems to make it well worth it going with the more powerful light. Yeah, and according to them, the... The grams per watt change, they considered it statistically significant. But as we go from 400 PPFD to 600 PPFD to 800 PPFD with LEDs, the grams per watt go from 1.7 to 1.5 to 1.6. So the grams per watt doesn't change that much. So the the efficiency, it's statistically significant, but still the um, changes are really small. So I feel like the sweet spot, according to this data set, the sweet spot seems to be 800 PPFD to achieve 66 grams per square foot. Because if we have the PPFD from 800 to 400, we almost exactly have the grams per square foot. So very similar efficiency. 800 PPFD seems to be the sweet spot. Going up to 1,200 PPFD, the efficiency goes down from 1.6 grams per watt to 1.2 grams per watt. So it's a pretty big drop in efficiency, but the um, the grams per square foot goes from 66 to 72. Yeah, you're getting an extra 0.2 pounds of cannabis by uh, increasing that, you know, and an extra 400 PPFD, which in the case of cannabis being such a high yield crop, that seems well worth it in this case. Their uh, income minus the cost of power shows that running at this exceptionally high PPFD of 1200 is more profitable if the pound price is based off of 2000. If we change that pound price to 1600, which might be a little bit more reasonable, then we might not see a benefit from going up to these higher light intensities. And it would, you know, it it feels best to run the lighting at an intensity, which will give us a higher efficiency. So I, I still feel like 800 or maybe 1,000 PPFD is our target. Um, but this is definitely based off of one strain, this uh, hazy OG. And we're going to see cultivars react very differently to light intensity. Yeah, that's a really good point. This is just a really preliminary study. It hasn't been peer-reviewed or replicated. There needs to be a lot more research. But it is interesting that people are starting to look at this sort of thing. And if we go to the next slide, which looks at cost recovery when we talk about LED versus HPS, and they compared that 700 PPFD double-ended HPS 
uh, at four hundred dollars for that fixture versus say the fluence fixture at uh, eight hundred ppfd, which is going to cost you almost thirteen hundred dollars to outfit a room. It's a difference of forty six thousand dollars per room for that fluence light versus fourteen and a half thousand for that HPS light. Now, when it comes down to your power usage per room at 21 cents a watt, you're looking at $3,500 to run that fluence light versus $5,300 to run that HPS light. So your power plus fixture, they have the calculations here. You're going to end up over time saving money by reducing your, reducing your energy consumption. Uh, but it is an initial investment that's going to be a lot higher than if you stuck with that double-ended HPS. Did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, whether whether you're running the lights, running LED lighting at 800 ppfd or 1200 ppfd versus the average of 700 ppfd with DE HPS, it's going to be a wash in the first crop. Whether you know the, the profitability of using LEDs versus HPS, it's going to be a wash in that first crop. But in subsequent harvests, we're looking at this twenty-five to thirty-eight thousand dollar increase. Looking at this, if we're looking at the same chart, um, so that's going to be cumulative over you know five to six turns per year. The LEDs get much more profitable to run. Whether we decide the twelve hundred ppfd is worth it or not, just slightly increasing the light intensity in ppfd with the LEDs is. Um, I can't come at a number right now, but it's looking like 10%, 10% more profitable to use LED. That sounds about right. Now, the other thing I found interesting about this is with the LEDs, if you're not using organic methods, if you're going with this multi-tiered uh, LED and hydroponic setup, you can double stack the lights, which allows you to effectively double the amount of square footage in a given room if the facility has a decent height because the LEDs don't run, don't generate the same level of heat that you're getting with the double ended HPS and have to be as far away from the canopy. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely, they're definitely more efficient. They definitely create less heat and they also don't, ca- the heat they generate isn't being projected out from the light. You know, DE HPS are going to project that that heat, that that uh, infrared from the light onto the canopy when the majority of the heat from the LED is coming off the heat sink on top of the fixture itself. So double stacking, it, you know, LEDs really make double stacking possible. And, the, and, you know, racking is expensive. LEDs aren't so cheap either. But regardless of your cost of real estate, just building out a facility with the proper HVAC and air movement, double stacking just makes sense. It, it, it definitely shows a return within a year. Okay, the Green Organic Dutchman. That was David Bernard Perron. Oh, man, I'm butchering his name. He's a good buddy of mine. Uh, David Bernard Perron. And his talk was on the future of organic cannabis production at a commercial scale. Do you want to highlight a little bit that we learned from that talk? So thanks to David, it looks like the Green Organic Dutchman has chosen to go with a 100% organic program because David's coming from Whistler Medical Marijuana Company, which is the first certified organic cannabis farm in the world. And um, I think that I'm pretty sure that bringing David on with his, with his experience and skill set gave them the confidence to commit to doing a 100% organic facility. What's really interesting about this place is they're doing a um, or they're creating a planting density and a um, how do I say this? They're they're creating the most technologically advanced organic production facility that I know of, and they're using concepts that draw from draw from synthetic nutrients, uh, draw, draw from conventional agriculture, in that they look at soil mineralization and look at mineral uh, mineral balance and mineral ratios, but they're also committed to using all organic approved inputs. So it's a really biologically driven farm, and they're looking at how they can make this most efficient using technology, whether they're looking at um, mineral analysis, like leaf tissue analysis, or looking at how they can automate the processes of transplanting or irrigation, fertigation, recycling runoff water, they're really taking, I think what's interesting about what 
a lot of people we like are into is this merging of soil chemistry and soil biology or biointensive farming. And so to take that to scale, they know that they will periodically have runoff. And that runoff is going to be captured and aerated and tested and amended and added back into the system. So not only are they not wasting water or wasting nutrients, they're conserving all those, they're keeping those all within the, within the facility, but they're using all the technology available to do it as efficiently and as intelligently as possible to maintain these, uh, these narrow ratios that we've developed in, in uh, soil minerals. Yeah, so this it's this merging of technology that's really interesting, and this idea of using living soils in controlled horticulture environments. And I, I love what they're doing. It's really a proof of concept based off of uh, Whistler Medical Marijuana Corporation, where where David was one of the the head growers there. Just to throw some numbers at listeners, uh, I pulled this off of the Green Organic Dutchman website. They're looking at 150,000 square feet. They've raised over $41.5 million for this project. It's over 100 acres, and they're looking to have the capacity to produce uh, 14,000 kilograms. I believe that's annually. It's just it's crazy what these numbers are. It's staggering. And these guys are shaping up to be the largest organic cannabis producer in the world. And I, I feel pretty confident they're going to achieve that. Well, we need them to be successful because one of the other speakers there, <laughs> and moving on, uh, Kronos, is got an even larger facility, and I believe they had a, I think they said it was a two hundred million dollar investment, and they were, uh, they're really taking over this space up in Canada. It's pretty amazing. I listening to them speak, just hearing the, just how intelligent they were and how business focused they were was really. Um, interesting and scary kind of all at the same time there they were talking about how they've actually figured out how to on the pharmaceutical level export the cannabis that they're growing to germany so that's opened up a whole nother market to them uh, they were sitting on stage with some phds and uh, people with really really smart guys with uh, really strong horticulture backgrounds and looking at everything as automation so for them it's all about lean manufacturing and operational optimization. They're not interested in being organic, but rather uh, pharmaceutical grade. Uh, everything's going to be sterile, it sounds like. And they're looking at it as how do we reduce the number of touches on each plant? It really it becomes a unit of measurement. It's not really this. It's really not so much about the plant at this point. It's really about uh, just. It sounds like making a ton of money is really what they're looking to do. So you know, I'm pulling for David and hoping that these guys can produce a model that shows that organics can compete on the same level as hydroponics in production on scale. So we will just have to wait and see how that all pans out. Yeah, that's what's, exci that's what's exciting to me. Uh, the, the, the level of automation and the, the budget they have to do this at scale with, with the Green Organic Dutchman, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around. But what's exciting to me is that the Green Organic Dutchman system is based on an organic reusable substrate. When, if you're a strictly bottom line mentality, you're not concerned with whether or not you discard the substrate. All that matters is what does it cost to discard the substrate and how much money does that make us? And if you live your life or if you run your business just by the numbers, that, of course, works. We have plenty of examples of that in, in commerce. It's the majority of examples we have in commerce. But that's not a solution. Like, we're trying to find an agricultural paradigm which is truly sustainable. And seeing, perceiving substrate as disposable, to me, is, it's ridiculous. And I consider it unintelligent. It's easier just to throw stuff away and then bring in a new substrate and treat it how you want, knowing that it'll be discarded, to actually develop a program where you're mindful enough of the mineralization and your pesticide program, your IPM program, such that you can reuse the soil indefinitely. That makes sense. Whether you're using coco coir or peat moss, it doesn't matter because this is a single one-time purchase. 
And the green organic Dutchman intends to do this at scale and use automation to compete with these guys who have even more money and even more scale that don't really care about the ecological impact or the carbon footprint or the impact on species that this sort of extractive approach to agriculture has. For, for T God, uh, the Green Organic Dutchman, to take this on, they're, they're, using, they're using Dutch tables, which are like uh, rolling benches, which typically roll side to side, which is really space efficient. Dutch tables roll side to side and front to back. So you can take this four by four area, which has plants in it in a bed, and move it to wherever you want in the facility automatically. So you can rotate your crops through, do perpetual harvesting, do efficient harvesting or efficient training or pruning because the machinery can move the plants that need to be worked on towards the head house or towards the, the centralized area where the most, most hands-on work has to happen. So to do that with an irrigation system and with an organic IPM program is much more difficult than with a synthetic program. It's going to be, they really are innovating hard in a lot of aspects, but I think they're up to it. Yeah, they even said that some of the technology that they're going to need to be successful isn't even, it doesn't exist yet. So they're <laughs> going to have to create some of it, especially around harvesting. It's pretty staggering when you think about the numbers that these guys are dealing with in, uh, in terms of their harvest. It kind of sounds like, it sounds like a, a um, what do you call it, a uh, investor meeting with Elon Musk. He's like, we don't, we don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it, and it's going to be done in 12 months. <laughs> I did kind of feel like I was at a TED Talk for most of the weekend. It was great. <laughs> now, I will play a devil's advocate a little bit here. One thing that I am encouraged by with people like Alice and Justice over at Outco and with Kronos is they're not going to be excessively applying phosphates and, well, and nitrates and other, and other mineral salts. Uh, it's just not cost efficient. So what we'll see is uh, less contamination, environmental contamination of specifically phosphates in the cannabis industry, which is awesome. Like I was talking with Allison about this, you know, that evening, and she was saying that their their runoff is in terms of the uh, nutrient levels is is minimal, which to me is awesome. Like if you're going to be, a, you know, a, a chem grower, if you're going to grow with mineral salts. Let's at least do it responsibly. So that's one good thing, I think, coming out of all of this uh, as we move to scale and efficiency. Mm -hmm. If there's an excess amount of mineral salts or if there's an excess amount of nutrients that are coming out of organic beds, it doesn't matter what your approach is. If you have a runoff, if you have a waste stream, it's, it's a waste stream made out of nutrients and water, which is what we're trying to apply to the plants. So whether you're a synthetic grower or an organic grower, you should capture this runoff, test this runoff, amend it appropriately, and fertigate it back into the plants. And it's just funny that these synthetic farmers assume there is a waste stream. And so once there's runoff, they consider that waste. But the organic-minded people see that runoff as a resource. Yeah, well said. So moving along here, and not to be outdone, the next speaker was Village Farm, and I hadn't heard of them, but they are one of the largest greenhouse production companies in all of North America. They have uh, greenhouses in the United States, in Canada, in Mexico, and their offices are in Florida. They have over 200 acres of greenhouses. Epic. I remember he put he put this slide up, and we're talking about beautiful glass, environmentally controlled greenhouses. They're incredible. And they're looking to do 25 acres of that in cannabis as their sort of their first step into the Canadian market. They decide on Canada based on all the you know politics and restrictions and laws currently going on between, you know, within North America, looking at uh, the United States versus Canada, they decide on Canada. So that's three huge players all in the same room growing massive amounts of cannabis. Uh, what do you think the effect of, of these sorts of farms are going to be on smaller 
growing operations. I mean, that was my very first concern. I was like, oh man, I am so glad I'm not trying to run a legal facility up in Canada right now. I mean, how would you even compete with these these other guys? In in Canada, you really I don't know if you can compete as a as a small scale cultivator or distributor or processor. It's just it, it's so I want to say it's it's so WTO, you know, it's so big. Everything's at scale. The economy of scale that these producers uh, experience, it just weeds out the small farms. So, but we're, we're in the U.S. And so the question is, how are these mega Canadian producers going to affect U.S. rec producers? And I can tell you in Oregon, there's already been the first major acquisition of, uh, of Chalice Farms earlier this year, I think for $10 million. And they were acquired by a Canadian company. So the influence of Canadian scaled producers aren't going to influence U.S. producers because they're just not here producing. But they are going to be the way they're going to influence the market in the U.S. is through acquisitions. So it's I guess it's something to be mindful of that eventually it's going to get very big and consolidated, just like most aspects, just like pretty much every other sector of agriculture. It's something to make a plan for. Like, how do we, how do producers find a niche which makes it so they don't have to scale to these unbelievable, these unbelievable sizes just to compete? Because these guys, like, you know, this tomato guy, what's his name? Village Farms? Paul Salina was the he was the VP of Applied Research. Yeah, so Paul Salina from Village Farms, they're going to convert a 25 acre glass house to cannabis, which seems like it could be disruptive because he has the infrastructure already built, he has experience with the scale, but he's growing tomatoes, and tomatoes aren't easy. Like I, it, it's not that cannabis is so much harder than, than tomatoes, but I think that a lot of these people assume that cannabis is just another crop like tomatoes or cucumbers or peppers but the way that cannabis has been bred over the generations it hasn't been bred for disease resistance or pest resistance or fungal pathogen resistance it's been bred for yield and potency and so we have these tender cultivars that when we pack them into this massive facility where you Really, it's not feasible to have someone scouting and pulling open each bud looking for pedritis. These huge scaled facilities are going to see enormous crop loss. And you know they're going to be doing everything highly automated, highly mechanized when it comes to harvesting, deleafing, trimming. So we're just going to see a a lower quality of product. So the real question is how much better is craft cannabis than industrial cannabis, and will the market support that? You know, the way I took it was we're kind of moving in a few directions. So cannabis is going to be cultivated in a very limited amount of ways moving forward. We're going to have these huge suppliers doing hydroponics and multi-tiered, most likely multi-tiered LED setups indoors or using uh, greenhouses. We'll have organic people cultivating like what we're seeing with David, hopefully, That'll be the other way. And then we'll have outdoor people like uh, Eddie down at Phantom Farms that'll be cultivating large scale giant trees, you know, like an outdoor crop, essentially like a farmer would. And then lastly, we'll have, you know, probably that black market home grower. And that'll really be it. I'm not sure that these craft guys will be able to survive unless the market demands it, unless we get enough public outcry that says that we really want to preserve these genetics, we want to preserve these jobs, and we'll buy based on a brand. You know, like I know that I like Gold Leaf Gardens flower because of the way it's grown, and they've created this reputation in the industry. But beyond that, I think it's going to be really, really tough. I think the price of cannabis is going to drop dramatically. So we'll have, it'll just be like when you walk in the grocery store, you go to Costco, you can get you know, bananas for like two dollars. It's it's insane how cheap things are. So, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but that's kind of the way. I, that was my takeaway from this this conference. That's probably the most important thing to be mindful of for producers is that margins are going to steadily shrink. There is, I heard mentioned numerous times that 
margins, like profit margins, are typically one to five percent. And profit margins, farm to farm, in cannabis vary so much because we're all learning how to balance nutrients and provide the uh, the um, the appropriate biology to use automation or use mechanical equipment to do processing. The profit margin is what's really important. Producers have to keep their profit margins as tight as possible. But my concern is that it's going to lower quality and it's going to, and not, and by quality, I don't just mean how it looks. I mean, how it tastes and how in the actual cannabinoid profile, when there's more attention to detail, we get a better cannabinoid profile. Just like your attention to a garden as a, a garden, you know, a hundred square feet of tomatoes versus a hundred thousand square feet of tomatoes, you're just going to grow more tasty tomatoes in your garden. And the reason the taste is so important, it, there's, um, I wish I could cite it, but there's research showing that tomato breeding done with open pollination has bred these tomatoes that are the best tasting. And that's why, that's why, um, that's what drove the breeding was taste. But then we got the technology to put these tomatoes into a whatever machine to analyze their nutrient content. We found that by breeding by taste, we bred the most nutritious tomatoes. We bred the most medicinal tomatoes. So that's, that's what's important to me about cannabis is that we maximize or optimize the cannabinoid interpretive profile because that is why we use it. That's why we embrace it because it is medicinal or it is psychotropic. There are, I've seen some small tomato startups that are like two to 10 acres or maybe five to 20 acres, typically under plastic or under glass. But these are scales that are affordable to, you know, to, I don't know how you say it, like normal people. And that if you produce a tomato that just tastes better than everyone else's tomato, you can create a market niche. You can sell directly to restaurants or you can have a presence in the farmer's markets and people will seek you out and you'll develop a name for yourself just because your tomatoes taste better than any other tomato you've come across. And that's what craft cannabis is right now. It's, it's people who, it's people who do business and run their farm the way they do because they love it because they have a passion for it. And that really shows in the product. I hope you're right. I really, really do. I, I would hate to see a lot of these smaller companies go away that are doing really good work uh, simply because the cost to stay technologically uh, com competitive becomes too high. Agreed. And, you know, worst case scenario is that cannabis producers are forced to produce at a very narrow margin. And the upside of that is that the most economical way to grow is the most ecological way to grow. So if we find ourselves in a commodity cannabis economy, we'll find full season outdoor becoming the most relevant. And for those growers to enjoy an economy of scale, they simply have to create a co-op or create a distribution entity where they can pool their product and sell it in large amounts. So the producers don't have to be concerned or don't have to um, deal with the cost of marketing or processing, they just focus on doing their, or they uh, focus on running their production with the lowest ecological and economical impact. Which is another reason that we need uh, some sort of certification in cannabis for organics, so that we have another way of differentiating out plants, you know, plants that were grown organically for consumers to feel confident in the quality and safety of their crop. I mean, right now there's a lot in the in the Washington rec market that I wouldn't trust simply because I know the regulations aren't able to control, aren't able to do effective regulation on spraying. And I know that there's companies out there that are taking advantage of that. Yeah, we've, we've seen a million recalls or whatever. We've seen dozens of recalls or upwards of 100 recalls across the nation from pesticide-tainted pr cannabis products. And if we enter this economy where the margins are really tight, like a one to five percent profit margin, we're going to see a lot of producers that are that are tempted or feeling forced to do certain agricultural or utilize 
agric certain agricultural practices to push that yield up X percent. And so rather than waiting for the government to regulate us, if we use, if, if the industry regulates itself, like Certified Kind or the Re Renewable Innovation Institute, if we use these, um, these regulatory bodies that have grown out of the industry, then we can assure that producers that stick to their ethics can be compensated appropriately and maintain their margins. If, if, you know, if farm X and farm Y both have a 5% margin, but farm X has a higher cost of production because they stick to organic methods, then they should be compensated for that. And that doesn't mean that the organic cannabis will be twice as much. Maybe it'll only be 10% more expensive or 15% more expensive, which will ultimately be a, a nominal increase in, in a retail price. Yeah, I mean, there's a you pay a premium for organic products already on the produce side uh, because you believe in that certification. So if I, well, you and I have the fortunate circumstance of being good friends with Andrew Black, who owns Certified Kind, so we know the standards to which he's holding growers that are using his certification. But I would happily pay 20% more in a rec store for that certification. So the idea being that the certification would pay for itself for that grower uh, in the sense that the public would recognize that and say, hey, I, it's important to me to know that someone is looking out over this farm and actually, I guess, double checking and reassuring me that what they're claiming is, is accurate and they aren't using any inputs that aren't organic and they're not spraying any pesticides that are known carcinogens and only approved for use on ornamental crops and uh, doing the testing that right now the, the states just can't keep up with. Yeah, and, and, I, and I know, you know I'm, and I'm friends with Andrew Black, and he's an amazing man, of very high integrity. And of course, he wants he wants to certify more farms so he can get his annual certification fee. But he won't certify a farm if it doesn't meet the organic standards. And the whole point of this, like the the industry that he's supporting or the the market that he's supporting, is people who do the work, which is a lot of it's a, it's a lot of intellectual work to assure that you can create an organic product to the organic standard and make it competitive in this in this free market. So the the game really is to stick to your ethics and lower cost of production. Now, since we're on the subject, I actually did interview Andrew, but uh, both of us agreed that the conversation just didn't flow all that well. It's not the most exciting topic for a lot of listeners. Uh, since we're talking about it, I wouldn't mind touching on it briefly, though. I know that you were looking into setting up a certification a while back. And uh, can you talk about some of the challenges around certification just, you know, for a minute or two and give people a little background onto it? Because I had I had no idea what went into a certification at all for or setting up a, a company like that. When I when I set out to develop my own certification for cannabis, I thought that I could simplify the standard and be clear about no synthetic inputs and just make it very easy to understand the standards and to condense the hundreds and hundreds of pages that must be digested or referenced to run an organic program. I thought I could condense that into a page or a sheet or a, or a paragraph. And what I realized is that just it's, it's an ideal and it can happen. Like you can use no synthetics. You can practice a regenerative model with no synthetic inputs. You can use on-site or local resources to provide for your fertility and your pest management. But that is the exception, not the norm. And the most important thing, which I said before, is that organic agriculture, regenerative, sustainable, however you say it, this must become the norm. And this must compete and displace synthetic, unsustainable agriculture. And so we have to be a bit pragmatic in that minute amounts of synthetic nutrients can be utilized so we can have crop yields and crop quality in an organic program that can compete and displace the synthetic paradigm that we're living in now, which is, you know, destroying topsoil and creating large amounts of runoff and poisoning farm workers, et cetera. I don't disagree with anything you're saying there. I do want to get back to 
the topic of this conference, and I want to save my favorite speaker for last. So I'm going to jump out of order here. One of the last uh, panels I heard from was uh, Michael Williams, Director of Operations at Flourish and Harborside Health Center, uh, Eric Culberson, Director of Cultivation at Columbia Care, and then uh, Jeremy Plum, who's out of Portland. He's co-founder and Director of Cultivation at Pharma and Proof. And the three of them were up there talking about genetics, uh, chemotype expression, and some of the medicinal uh, value and research that's being done around these cannabinoids. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what your takeaways were from their from their panel? Uh, you know the, the 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 topic of conversation after their presentation was genetic drift. What is genetic drift, and is genetic drift an issue with clonal propagation and should we be really motivated to move from normal normal clonal propagation to micro propagation tissue culture and even those guys on stage they had i feel like they uh they each touched on the issue and some of them seemed to backpedal around this this genetic drift term because it's just not an accurate term for why we're attracted to tissue culture. So what's really happening here? It seems that the, the major problem is not, it's not genetic drift, first of all, because we're not growing cannabis from seed. It doesn't grow true to seed. So that term genetic drift is not accurate in terms of the mutations that we're seeing uh, from a, just a terminology perspective. So we really do need a new word for that. And that was something that they were talking about. But what seems to be really happening is that people are cloning from unhealthy mother plants. And that's a real problem. And that's where we're seeing the degradation in quality over time or in you know plant growth and health and cannabinoid levels. So I think we need to encourage people to make sure that they have really, really healthy mother plants prior to cloning. And that's something that I've seen in a lot of the facilities I visit is the mother room is not the best looking room in the facility and it really needs to be. And Jeremy, I believe, was the one talking about how he likes to even have a redundant mother room. Mm -hmm. Like he's willing to dedicate a whole nother space just to make sure that we're preserving genetics and keeping up the quality of the genetics because clonal propagation is still the standard in the industry as tissue culture is slowly coming on and people are doing more research around it. And the other thing they would talked about that was interesting, I hadn't heard the term before, but chain cloning, the idea of uh, cloning your next crop off of your previous crop before you put them into flower. And the danger with that is really the idea of all the disease you're spreading. It's much easier to keep one or a handful of mother plants really, really healthy uh, and bug free than it is to try and maintain that across the entire crop. So you may be just pe perpetuating your disease problems that way too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, like if you, if you look into tissue culture, you understand what the benefits are of it and the, the potential of it to lower cost of production and to increase how many crops per year a producer can, pr can, can, can produce whether it is indoors or in a light deprivation greenhouse. So the technology is there. Implementing it at a small scale is really difficult. Implementing it at a large scale is, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's just the way that tissue culture is efficient is at scale. So the idea that every farm or any like one acre farm is going to have a tissue culture production facility I think is really, it's really idealistic. It's not naive. It's just idealistic because there's a long learning curve that goes with TC. And w as we see TC become part of the industry, it's not going to be in a decentralized way at first because of the learning curve. The, I think the reason people are so attracted to it is because a lot of people, whether they're new or advanced or very experienced, have this sort of like knee jerk reaction to taking a clone of a clone of a clone of a clone because they feel like they're going to experience genetic degradation. In reality, that's not true. Taking a clone of a clone of a clone does not degrade genetics. It can, it will maintain genetics just fine over enormous amounts of time. But if your cloning process is not consistent and you're experiencing or you're, 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 um, 
creating stressed out plants and numerous, numerous of these generations, then that could damage the genetics. So the issue here is not that we need to move away from consecutive cloning and then we need to move to TC. The issue really is that we need to get better at propagation. Yeah, my other concern too is that as we get these larger scale facilities uh, and fewer fewer companies in the cannabis industry, uh, we may lose some of that genetic diversity. Because right now in history probably exists the largest amount of genetic diversity around cannabis that has ever existed in the world since the beginning of time. And my hope is that we can maintain and grow upon this. I mean, you have people like the people on this panel, like Jeremy and Michael, that are growing out you know, hundreds of chemotypes and, and selecting for cultivars that are going to be, you know, higher in CBG or uh, contain different medicinal properties as we learn more and more about the effects of these different cannabinoids on humans and on different diseases that we're facing. So my hope is that we continue to grow that because it seems to me, and not being a medical patient who relies on cannabis, uh, I, I can't say 100%, but I've heard this story where people who are patients will say, you know, I really only get I get good results from this one cultivar grown by these, you know, this one person. Like I stay with this brand because it really helps. It helps my, you know, my treatment. And that's something I hope we can maintain. It's true. I've, I've, I've heard good research presented around, around what cannabinoid ratio gives relief to certain medical symptoms. And maybe you need a, a one-to-one CBD to THC ratio, or maybe, maybe you need a two-to-one or a one-to-two, or maybe it's a 10-to-one or a one-to-ten. And this really is based on people's endogenous endocannabinoid system um, and what symptom they're trying to treat. So we do need this diversity of cultivars or chemotypes because that is what solves the problem. So this isn't just about like this strain tastes so cool. We have to maintain this like the skunky pineapple flavor. Really, it's that we found this cultivar that has this cannabinoid ratio or this cannabinoid terpenoid profile that will relieve the symptoms of X illness. And that's just so valuable. We've never I, I don't feel like we've ever come across a plant that has this diversity of chemotypes and that the chemotypes are so important to specific illnesses. Yeah, I totally agree. And that being said, in the in the interest of not letting this podcast go too long, I have saved the best for last, in my opinion, uh, the one that I'm most excited about, and I'm still working to get her on this podcast, so we'll see. But Suzanne Wainwright Evans, also known as the Bug Lady, that's not an insult, she refers to herself that way. <laughs> uh, she, I had never heard her speak, Jaya, you've obviously had conversations with her, and I remember you telling me how excited you were the first time you heard her speak at Canacon. She gave a really good talk, and I kind of wanted to go through that one in a little more depth than we did with some of the other ones. Yeah. Uh, I'll go ahead and start off with uh, some of my notes, because I took pretty extensive notes on this one, and feel free to jump in where you feel appropriate. So she started talking about some of the reasons for using beneficial insects. And one of the first things she talked about was worker safety. So we're reducing pesticide sprays. So that's going to help protect uh, the human workers in the room. It's also going to reduce the amount of pesticide resistance that we're already seeing. As you know, if you spray the same thing for your spider mites, you know, cycle after cycle, they will build up resistance. And then it also will help with limitations that we're seeing both on a regulatory level, but also um, from public outcry or public opinion in terms of pesticide residues on our crops. Uh, the first thing that she said in getting started with beneficial insects was to form a relationship with someone who knows what they are doing and what they're talking about. And that to me seems like the most important, the most important tip that she gave right there. So that's the first thing she said. And then she said, uh, commit to scouting your plants. You really need to look really close at your plants and keep an eye on what's going on so you can get an accurate identification of the problem. And interesting enough, she, she was saying how, you know, depending on if you're dealing with a dirt floor or a concrete floor or a gravel floor can actually affect what her recommendations are. So it's not as simple as saying this bug eats this bug or this bug survives in this this environmental condition or lighting or temperature, but you actually uh, have to really have 
a pretty high level of knowledge of entomology to successfully impl- you know, implement these, these bugs. Definitely. There's, there's, there's all these systems that you have to be cognizant of when you're doing production. Like if you're growing in pots versus in beds, then the ability for those biocontrols to cover the space is much different. There's only, there, there, only so many biocontrols can move from plant to plant. So if you have a contiguous soil underneath your canopy, then these biocontrols can move across the landscape and colonize the space much more effectively than if you have individual pots. And the idea, it depends on the biocontrol. Some biocontrols, you're assuming they will not create a breeding population and you're going to use an inundative release program to assure that you have proper control. Other biocontrols will naturalize in the space. And if the space is such that they can navigate the square footage, like in a bed or in long rows, certain biocontrols like um, soil dwelling um, soil dwelling predators will be able to move across that space and you can develop a breeding population which becomes uh, naturalized in that greenhouse or in that site if the floor plan you know is conducive to that that predator yeah she talked about how we need to also improve our practices as growers and stop spreading all of these bugs around especially with our cuttings like the hemp russet mite doesn't fly. The reason it's being spread so rapidly is because people keep bringing it into their facility with new cuts and new clones. And so one of the things she talked about with that is we need to do a better job of uh, biocontrol with our management strategy. So she had talked about dipping cuttings. Like literally uh, she had some photos of a colander with the plant tissue or your cutting inside of it and dipping that into uh, the industry standard apparently is Botanigard with Root Shield, which is a trichoderma product. Uh, she also mentioned Suffoil X is another one that you could potentially use as a dip, though they're currently not uh, uh, certified for that. But also keeping your tools clean. And she had a, a great photo of some clippers and there were three different stages on it. So the first one was the, the sanitizer and then the second one was the, the second sanitizer to remove the larger plant material. And then the last one was a clean wash so that you could move from room to room or, or plant to plant without spreading any of these bugs. And then she also mentions pulling dying foliage. So not having, you know, dying leaves there that could be potential habitat. And then lastly, being really selective on who enters your facility. And she, she talked about how uh, she goes to a lot of facilities and they never even ask her where she's been or what she's wearing. Uh, they don't ever put on coveralls. I'm always very careful when I go out on a consult to make sure that my clothes are clean. I haven't been in here any other cannabis plants or any other vector plants. And I know over at Goldleaf, they have a floor mat with a sanitizing solution in there that you step into before you walk into a room and they also limit room to room movement so on the potential that you may have picked something up you're not carrying it into that next room your workflow doesn't involve going into multiple rooms in a in a given day Mm -hmm. and whether you're running a facility which has which has really strict biosecurity protocols where you know all employees must shower and put on their you know their bunny suit their shoe covers and head covers whether you have a, a highly clean facility or a, a pretty loose facility, either way, your flow, like your workflow throughout the day, should start in the facilities that are, or in the sections of your facility which, which are cleanest and move throughout the day towards the least clean space. So you're not bringing, you know, you could have, you could have spider mites and veg, which are easily dealt with. But if you have spider mites to flower, it could ruin your crop. And so you have to think about how you move through the facility throughout the day and that you're not creating, you know, you're not taking a minor problem and tracking it into a space where it will become a major problem. And, uh, and scouting, scouting is the, I think it's the foundation of IPM, regardless of how sustainable or not sustainable your IPM program is, you have to scout and get a, and create a, an SOP around what is light pressure of this pest and what is medium pressure of this pest and find out a way to quantify that quickly and easily and keep track of it so whoever is in charge of running this facility can look at this data and make a plan around your insecticide or IPM or biosecurity protocol that keeps them below an economic threshold. Because the idea, the idea is not to have no pests. 
it's to maintain pests below an economic threshold. Yeah, she talks about how it's really important to keep records so you can see when your pest pressures are occurring, how heavy they are, what you're seeing in that room. And one of the things she mentioned is that you don't have to know every pest out there. You just have to know the pests that you end up having to deal with in your facility consistently over time. And it's really important to know the different life stages of not only the pests, but also the beneficials. And she uses the example of, um, let's see, what was it here? On that tip of uh, you only need to know so many pests to do proper scouting, I, I really feel that. because At this point in my life, if I am sent a photo of an insect that I've never seen before, I assume it's not a pest. Because if it was a pest, I would have heard of it. You know, I'm, I'm not like I'm not a hard line on that. I know I'm always uh, if I, if I see a new insect, I want to know, or I, I will seek out the information to find out if it's a pest or a predator. But there's only so many cannabis pests that we generally have to deal with. Yeah. So I want to I want to come back to uh, scouting, but the, the the example she gave was aphids. So this was really interesting. I'm talking a little bit about aphids. She said that aphids uh, can be color morphs, which means that they can actually change the, the color that they are. And so something like a green peach aphid isn't necessarily green. It could be red and isn't necessarily going to be on a peach. So you really have to look at the morphology, the characteristics of that aphid to determine what it is. And the thing with aphids is they actually suck the sugars out of the plant and exude this honeydew, which is the sugar that then the ants come along and then wasps will eat that as well. And then you get this sooty mold uh, that will develop on the honeydew. And right now we have major insecticide resistance on white flies and Western flower thrips. And she was saying a lot of the conferences she's going to on entomology, they think aphids will be the next wave. And interesting enough, aphids give live birth. So if the mom is resistant to insecticide, these kids that are an exact clone of her will be as well. So uh, really, really interesting stuff. And she had a video of a green lacewing sucking the inside and it's an immature it's the i think it's juvenile stage sorry juvenile stage sucking the inside of the aphids leaving these dead bodies behind and it's so important to know if something is still alive based on what biocontrol your agent so if you know you're applying lace wings then you should be seeing these uh leftover skins or shriveled versions of aphids that are dead and so you really have to get down in there and and start identifying these things she also showed a video of a predatory mite. I can't remember if it was Californicus or Persimilis or Phalasis, but it was feeding on a red mite. I don't, I'm not sure what kind of spider mite it was, but it was red in color. And as it fed on the red mite, it took on, the, as a predatory mite fed on the red mite, it took on the color of the red mite. And so these mites are the same size, same shape, and then they can periodically be the same color. So it makes scouting a much more complex task because you really have to look at the eggs and see if there are um, exclusively spider mite eggs on the leaf or if there are predatory mites there also. And uh, the way that I think is really like much less like intellectual and more applied is looking at how spider mites move across a canopy because uh, many people have seen spider mites sweep across a canopy very quickly but with a proper inundative biocontrol release program, you can observe or you can scout and monitor spider mite hotspots that don't seem to spread because there are predators in that area. So when you take that leaf off and you see those pests on the leaf, you really have to look at it. And you're not just looking for how many pests there are. You're looking to see if there's a predator present. Scouting is not just about scouting for pests. It's about scouting for predators. Yeah, she did talk more about some of the tools with that. So you, you'll want to have a hand lens, uh, which she was a bang board, which is uh, it looked like the to a top of a white cooler for lack of a better definition that I can visually describe. And she said it's much better to knock the bugs off the plants onto the board where you can see them scurrying around than trying to lift up the undersides of leaves. Uh, you need something to take photos with, uh, whether it's a a camera or your cell phone uh, scouting form so you're writing this stuff down and then she did recommend a handheld uh, microscope that hooks up to USB that I wrote down somewhere in here I don't know if you know off the top of your head yeah dino light there's a there's a lot of USB microscopes on the market 
the Dino Light sells scopes for, ranging from fifty dollars to fourteen hundred dollars, depending on the resolution and depth of field that you desire. But she recommended a hundred and fifty dollar Dino Light, and um, Sound Horticulture also has a Dino Light on their website that I think is around one hundred fifty or two hundred fifty dollars. That is sufficient to take really nice, really high resolution photos of pests or predators so that you can document them, track them, and submit the photos to entomologists or insectaries so you can so everyone can be sure of what the pest problem is. Yes, so that leads us back to identification. She says, do not guess, because it makes a big difference what you're dealing with. So she used thrips as an example there. She said that echinothrips require a different mode of action than Western flower thrips. And beneficial nematodes don't work on echinothrips. So if you go in dealing with thrips and you just you call up a company and they say, uh, you tell them you have thrips, if they don't ask you what kind of thrips that they are, then you shouldn't be doing business with them. She was very adamant about that. And part of that is also knowing this plant pest life cycle because the Western f- flower thrip, everyone targets the foliage. You know, you spray the foliage. I've done that. But they have other life stages that are actually in the soil, which was something I wasn't aware of. So we need to treat all stages if we really want to manage this pest over time and get a handle on it. So identification, she said, don't guess, really important. Don't ask people on Facebook. Uh, it seems like a no brainer, <laughs> but I can't tell you how many times I've seen that in, in forums. So they'll put up one bug and they'll get 20 answers. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> and, Facebook is pretty rough. And people are confident too. That's the craziest part of it. They like, they know what it is, but uh, take photos. You can get one of those Dynalite magnifiers, and you can put the insects in alcohol and mail them. You know, if you need to get an idea, or take them to uh, a, an expert. You don't have to take a leaf if it's cannabis that's illegal, or you can't ship it. Uh, this is a great way to get an identification too. Yeah, when I was when I was when I was deep in the broad mite research, the um, the university research I found on it was to soak or to dip a leaf into alcohol. And so all the broad mites be washed off into it and they would die. And then they'll fall out of suspension relatively quickly. And so you can, if you're dipping a, you know, say you dip four leaves into the alcohol solution and then you can count the broad mites that come out of it or whatever your pest is, you can count those and and figure, oh, okay, I have this many pests per leaf. And so whatever your sampling or monitoring protocol is, as long as you do it consistently, you've got a constant. And then your only variable is the actual quantity of pests that you're finding. Another thing that she talked about too was pesticide compatibility. And she says there is a lot of compatibility between many of these pesticides and beneficial uh, beneficial insects. And I'll put the list up. Uh, there's AgriBio, BASF, BioBest, BioLine, uh, Copert. And these companies have uh, mobile apps even. And you can put in the generic name or even the brand in some cases of what the pesticide is and then you can see the effects on a given species of insect like you know simitus or californicus and it'll say you know whether it's going to kill all of them there's more than 75 percent or less than 25 percent and it makes a difference if you're doing a foliar application versus an irrigated application of that pesticide it's a great way to check and it'll tell you how long you need to wait before you can reintroduce those beneficial insects, which is really important because you don't want to do a spray and then bring in these beneficial insects and there's going to be lingering effects of that spray and you may not get, you know, you may just be killing off whatever you just spent money on. The, yeah, the databases that they've built for this pesticide compatibility with biocontrols are really great. But I, the majority of the data is centered around chemical insecticides, much of which are not permitted to be used on cannabis, um, but they're still useful. It's definitely worth digging into those and, and, and getting as much information as you can from them. What I really want to see in the, in the next few years is not just compatibility as in what will create pest mortality, but what insecticides could be a deterrent. Because there's, there's, you know, there's products like neem, which is a fantastic insecticide and antifeedant, but neem has a residual effect that is not insecticidal per se, but it is a deterrent or an antifeedant. So you could spray neem, right? let's say you spray a, a soap product or an oil product, the following day it would be safe to apply predators. And, but if you were to spray neem, 
the following day, you could apply predators and it wouldn't kill them, but it might make them all walk away. So it's really up to, up to cannabis producers to apply these biocontrols and observe their habits afterwards because we really are on the cutting edge of what, what works. So interestingly enough, we talked about neem. Mm -hmm. And she said that neem oil is not her favorite because it will actually prevent uh, a large majority of the eggs of some of these beneficial predatory mites from hatching. So she much prefers uh, light paraffin-based sprays. One in particular, Suffoil X, I'm working with them, trying to get set up as a distributor with them right now. But they're small size containers, two and a half gallons. You know, they're really designed for large scale commercial greenhouses. So looking for solutions for uh, smaller growers is something that we're currently working on right now. And I'm hoping to have uh, Suzanne give more feedback onto how these different sprays affect, you know, various predatory mites. But that's something you can do yourself too at home. And and we can, we can all learn together, you know. Mm -hmm. And that, and that, that bang board that she recommended, like she was, uh, her example was the, the lid of the styrofoam cooler that the predators arrive in. That's handy. It's got edges. And, um, the fact that it's white is crucial because I've experienced, um, you know, receiving biocontrols in the mail, seeing them all walk around. And as soon as I put it on the leaves of the plant, I can't see them with the naked eye. I could see them when they're on the, when they're in a container or on a white piece of paper, but once they're on the green leaf, they're, they're microscopic. You really need a hand lens to see them at that point. So the bang board is this really, it's so simple, but it's such an amazing tool to, to uh, properly scout or monitor. That brings up another point. She says she gives a whole hour long talk just on insect suppliers, because if you, depending on where you buy it, it may go from one person to another to another. And by the time the insects get to you, they may already be dead or they may be so stressed out that they're not going to want to eat or really do anything. So you as the consumer needs to learn how to identify healthy, uh, healthy insects as they arrive at your facility. So there's really a lot of knowledge that goes into this. It's quite amazing how much you have to know. Yeah. It's, it's never ending. It's kind of like, um, with, 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 uh, you get a, you get a package of, of predatory mites in the mail and you're trying to count them. Like, are there a thousand in this container? And I, and I, and I use the similar, the similar technique that I learned from looking at compost tea, where I'm looking at a, looking at a viewing area and it's like, all right, how many bacteria are in this viewing area? Is it, is it 50? Is it 500? Is it a thousand? And so you learn to look at a corner, like a quarter of that viewing area and say, okay, well, there's 250 in that viewing in a quarter of the viewing area. So most of a thousand in this, in this total viewing area. And so developing these little, these little tricks to quickly count, it's kind of like if you need to count how many leaves on a plant, you count a small a representative section and multiply it across the square footage. So you can, so you can do this sort of observation really quickly and come up with pretty accurate estimates. Is it so important to identify how many there are just to know that they're alive and active and healthy upon arrival? I would say you want to be cl- if 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 you ordered 5000 predatory mites then you should be able to count up close to 5000 quickly. If you're only counting about 1000, it's like, well, you know, I paid I paid for 5000, I only got 1000 and you know, 1000 might be still be plenty, but those predators if 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 a fifth of them no what should i say yeah if a fifth of them have already died then the ones that are left are starving and they probably don't have very much longer to live and when we're doing these biocontrol releases we're not necessarily we're not necessarily desiring the predators to naturalize so these really short crop cycles of a really high value crop and so our 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 um our approach is to release predators every week or two, or at least every four weeks. And so we're not counting on them developing a breeding population. We're just counting on them having the energy and the reserves, the food reserves, to walk around for a week or two before they starve to death. If they're you know, three days away from starving to death, then we're not getting our money's worth. That's really interesting because that's something she talked about that I hadn't really thought about. But she said, you're right. You're not trying to build ecology for these beneficial mites. You want them to starve to death. And she gives an example of persimilis needs higher humidity for their eggs to hatch. But if you're introducing them every week or every two weeks, then it doesn't matter if their eggs are hatching. The adults can still do their job. So you can't just look at that 
you know, the, the general charts that are out there on Persimilis and say, this isn't going to work in my situation. Uh, that's where having that expert is so important. I mean, her knowledge was just incredible. Um, I do want to get back to what she had to say about compost tea uh, at the very end of this, but I want to finish up on the notes that I do have that uh, from her talk during the during the conference itself. So she said there was very limited research on how lighting affects uh, these beneficial insects. Uh, the research still needs to be done. It didn't seem to be a big difference though between um, HPS and LED. She said in natural light, like in a greenhouse, you want your sticky cards facing south to get optimal collection. We don't know what that is in an indoor room. Uh, she said the research isn't there yet, but I had never thought about that. I did, did you know that you're supposed to have your, your sticky cards facing south? No, it never even occurred to me, but it makes perfect sense. Yeah, you get the most light from the south. If you're in North America, I should probably specify that if you're in the you know northern hemisphere. Yeah, we're, we're very, uh, what do you call it, northern hemisphere topic. Centric, yeah. Centric, <laughs> northern hemisphere centric. But in the sticky cards, the sticky cards do trap a fair amount of pests, but they're not really they're not they're not created or marketed as a biocontrol. They're marketed as a monitoring tool. That's why there's a grid on them. So every day or every three days or every week, however, whatever program you develop, you count. And those squares are useful. So you don't have to count every single bug on the card. You just count a few squares or a representative amount of squares. And you can monitor what your pest pressure is. That's what they're for. If you're trying to catch pests with sticky, with a sticky um, product, then you should be using sticky banner, which is you know like a three inch wide by thousand foot long roll, which is really cost effective and easy to string up between stocks. Yeah, I have that on the website. It is really, it's really easy to use. Let me touch on the last few points, and then I want to talk a little bit about compost tea. So uh, a couple of her notes that she had was aureus, which is the pirate bug, I believe. She was talking about how they have p banker plants with pollen because they need the pollen to survive. And you can buy the pollen now, but uh, really you can grow the, the plants that they will. So they'll go out there and eat, then they'll come back to the pollen. And that's how you keep them um keep them alive in your greenhouse and the best plant she said is a pepper variety called purple flash and they're able to grow the uh, highest amounts of aureus using that which i thought was really interesting and then the last thing was that she loves the slow release sachets she thinks they're great oh they're so cool i love time release sachets you know that we were saying that you want your bugs to be fresh and not about to starve to death because they can be fasting for I don't know exactly how much, but I know two to four weeks they can be without a food source and still stay alive and keep on looking for uh, looking for prey. And uh, the 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 pepper plant as uh, as a pollen source for your predators is great, especially because pepper plants are um, you know broad mites love pepper plants, and in my observation, I've seen broad you know typically broad mites are found on the lower side of the leaf. But on pepper plants, I find them in in relatively similar levels on the top side and the bottom side of the leaf. And it's when you're putting a pepper leaf under the microscope, it's easier, it's much easier to look at a pepper leaf than it is to look at a cannabis leaf when you're scouting. And the broad mites are attracted to this plant, look at the top of the bottom. And so it's a great indicator plant also for certain pests. I gotta say, I learned so much from her in that one hour talk. And I also learned how much I don't know, <laughs> which is great. I love learning new things. So that was really exciting. So as a side note, I've sort of been uh, wooing her to try and come on this podcast. And uh, hopefully hopefully we'll still get there. She hasn't said no or anything. So I'm, I'm hoping to follow up and, and maybe get her on here uh, live. But one of the things, she said she went to our website and she started looking at compost tea. And her initial thought there was... Uh, which is totally valid, I want to say, is that compost tea, there isn't enough peer-reviewed science around it. And so she doesn't promote it with growers and she doesn't like them to use it because we don't know everything that all the effects of compost tea. And she brought up some really valid points from a scientific perspective because, you know, we're trying to be science-based in what we do. We're trying to use research and data to drive the decisions that we make. We're not out here to try and sell and promote snake oil or things that aren't necessary or don't work. I mean, we all, there's plenty of research out there supporting the use of compost. 
and there's plenty of research supporting uh, the role of microorganisms in soil, but there aren't a lot of good peer-reviewed studies or really anything out there that I've seen that's definitive regarding compost tea. Mm -hmm. And I have some thoughts on this, but is there anything you want to add before I comment? I mean, I know, the, <clears throat> I know the problem with people's problem with compost tea is is people's problem with biochar, and that the, there's not there's not a, a good science to support the use of compost tea or biochar. And the reason is not that compost tea and biochar don't work; it's that how the compost tea or the biochar is created, and that's so variable. And I think that's why we don't have good science on it. I'm going to disagree with you there. I actually was just talking with Rennell. Anderson over at uh, Black Owl Biochar, and they actually are coming out with some really good research research from uh, Cornell and some of these ag universities that she's hopefully going to be able to share share with me. So in that regard, I think biochar is a little further along because they can produce it more consistently. If you know, in her case, where they're they're using something called virgin forest slash, which is the leftover debris after they log an area, and that stuff is a oh, it's a potential danger because it could catch fire and create a fire hazard. And they're able to sequester the carbon and create a usable product by burning it uh, in these, you know, pyrolyzing it in these kilns. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk more about biochar with her. But the big issue I see with compost tea is, is something you touched on there that it's inconsistent. We're not getting the same batch of tea every time. In fact, we're not even getting the same batch depending on how long we brew for. So that brewing cycle can determine if we have an excess of bacteria, if we have an excess of ciliates or uh, protozoa, flagellates. It's just not going to be consistent. So any real research on that, it's going to be hard to have good controls. And the ones I've seen really haven't done that. Uh, her, her other concern was also pathogens in compost tea, things like E. coli, salmonella. And there has been some research in that regard, but Again, you can make compost tea wrong and the potential is there for pathogens and the potential is there for you know, something that may not be as helpful in terms of increasing your nutrient cycling and plant growth. I thought it was an interesting point that she brought up and I love that she was just very honest and frank with me about her opinions, which I, I can totally respect. But I, I do see a lot of benefit to compost tea and I think there are cases where it's it's definitely worthwhile, but we do need more trials and studies on things like this for sure. So I, I feel like your approach to compost tea is assuring that the compost tea is aerobic and that excludes pathogens. So if there's all these different people using different compost sources and compost tea brewers, what do you think determines whether a compost tea is safe or not safe. So there's a few steps there. Uh, one of them is yes, maintaining that oxygen levels high enough. But things like E. coli are facultative anaerobes. They're in the soil. They're everywhere. We need to be aware of that. And so we need to choose a compost source that is safe. So for us, that means something that's not manure based. Though you could, in theory, use manure based compost if they were fully composted. But it's a little riskier because we're talking about a compost pile that's massive and trying to eliminate a bacteria is really, really pretty challenging, but it has to all generate a, you know, a temperature of a heat above 131 degrees. So for us, it's a matter of having clean inputs and controlling that and then controlling our oxygen levels and make sure we're not overwhelming our compost tea brewer with too many food sources so that the microorganisms are reproducing at a rate that we can control. So there is some science involved. And her other thing was when we were talking about this, she's like, a lot of the growers I work with, you know, they're not, they're not that science minded. They're not going to do all of these things. It's not a safe technology for her to recommend based on the fact that there are all of these other variables. So it was an interesting point and not one that I had thought about as a perspective in a long time because it's, I've been, you know, so narrowly focused in this industry and, and seen compost tea as a beneficial technology for so long, but she brought up a really good point. Yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to touch on regarding this conference that uh, really sparked your interest or, or got you excited? You know, the, 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 the part that is most, most like, uh, how do I say it? The most exciting to me and the most affirming to me is that all of these different technological advancements are interdependent, that we have to have, we have to utilize high-tech lighting and high-tech HVAC and, and um, 
and use the, the, the latest, utilize the latest science and biocontrols and put all these things together if we're going to have a sustainable agricultural paradigm, especially if we're going to do it indoors. And I love indoor agriculture. I love controlled environment agriculture. And the inspiring thing about this conference was realizing that this I, that it is affirmed to me that this truly is the future of agriculture, where we can increase yields a great amount and create food and medicine for ourselves in a much smaller amount of space. So we don't have to continually or continue to cut down the forest and destroy or degrade more lands in order to provide for ourselves. And so it, 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 it kind of um, confirmed with me that this technological approach to agriculture will be a large part of the solution to sustainable human settlement. You know, that's a really good point. For me, the thing I was most excited about was just the amount of smart people in one room that were all, <laughs> all focused on horticulture. I mean, the amount of growing knowledge in that room was incredible. It was mind blowing. And the fact that so many of the people there were open-minded to hearing uh, different points of view and all the different styles of cultivation. I mean, we had organic guys, we had hydro guys, we had HVAC guys, and everyone was a really a specialist and uh, an expert in their own little part of the industry and fairly successful at it. It was just really exciting to me to see because there was no, uh, as they talked about, there was no secret sauce there. There was no one selling, you know, particular bottled nutrient brands. Uh, they wouldn't survive in a room like that because those growers just don't have the have the time or energy to to deal with those kind of those kind of companies. They can't afford to use those kinds of products. And they're, you know, frankly, they're smart enough that they that they can figure it out for themselves. It's great to see, uh, it's great to see that level of involvement and energy all in one room. I had, I had a great time. Yeah. I've never been around so many people who are leaders in their field who are so unassuming. It was, it was amazing that there was just a, a lack of ego in the room. Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. People were so open-minded and friendly and I love being able to go up and ask a question and not, uh, <laughs> not feel stupid for not knowing the answer, you know? And these were like, you know, people with PhDs, people who had been growing for 20 years, you know, people who are running million dollar facilities. Really, really cool. One last thing I want to ask you, if you want to touch on it or not, is I know you were doing a trial uh, recently that you were kind of overseeing uh, using the LED lighting, the fluence lights and beds, sort of this uh, proof of concept that we saw from David with living soils under LED lighting in a bed. Can, can you talk a little bit about what some of your preliminary results were and what you were comparing? I know uh, the KISS soil was one, of the, was one of the three beds you were using. Yeah, the data is still coming in on it, so I don't want to be too firm on the numbers, but um, we're, uh, we're getting data uh, like 16 square foot section by 16 square foot section, which is commonly referred to as a light, even though you know 16 square feet is a light typically. But uh, even though we're using more um, LED fixtures than that per square foot, but we're uh, the comparison was between Kiss soil and a couple of other water-only soils, and seeing anywhere from a 37 to 75 gram per square foot, which is just amazing. You know, depending on cultivar, 37 to 75 grams per square foot and 70 gra 75 grams per square foot under these LED lighting, uh, LED lights is about 1.75 grams per watt. So it's just, it's just amazing yield. I mean, the yields are fantastic and the efficiency is, it's amazing. And the cannabis looks good. I mean, I haven't seen the, the final product myself. The, you know, the, the, I haven't, you know, I haven't got any uh, cannabinoid terpenoid test done yet, but the look of it, the trichome density is superb and the nose on it is amazing. So I'm, 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 I'm more than pleased with the results. I'm, I'm kind of blown away by it and I don't even want to, I, I feel, I feel weird presenting the data before it's all in because I want to be really clear about like what strain yielded what per square foot. But the numbers coming in so far are um, some of the best I've seen. All right. We'll just tease that then for a future episode. We won't give it all away. 
Yeah, Perfect. It's coming. <laughs> well, thanks, John. <laughs> I, had, I had a really fun time hanging out with you this last weekend, and I look forward to seeing you here again soon. Thanks for your time. Yeah, today. super fun, man. Good talking to you. All right. Thanks. You are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. Don't forget that there's more information and articles available on our website and blog at www.kisorganics.com, as well as links to the data and information we discussed in this episode on the podcast page. And if you enjoy these podcasts, please take a moment to leave me a review on iTunes and send me your feedback and suggestions through our website contact page.